Hello, and welcome to another episode of our Outlier Investor Series, where we dig into the ideas, frameworks, and strategies used by world-renowned investors across public and private markets. I'm Daniel Scrivener, and on the show today, I'm joined by Steve Vassallo, general partner at Foundation Capital and author of The Way to Design. In this episode, we explore what it's like to reinvent a venture capital firm. Foundation Capital was founded in 1995, 27 years ago by Bill Elmore, Catherine Gold, and Jim Anderson. One of Foundation's early claims to fame was that it was one of the first investors in Netflix back in the early 2000s. If you've read The Power Law, which is an incredible historical overview of venture capital by Sebastian Malaby, you'll know that Silicon Valley is littered with venture capital firms whose fates have risen and fallen over the years. Very few venture firms survive a single decade, let alone multiple decades, and those that do survive for decades have to reinvent themselves time and time again, which is exactly why I wanted to interview Steve Vassallo. Over the last 15 years, he's helped reinvent foundation capital, turning around lagging performance, investing in entirely new types of businesses and companies, and in the process, he's helped usher in an incredible new era at foundation capital. This episode is our definitive guide to reinventing a venture capital firm. In it, we cover Steve's early years bringing design, product, and engineering together at IDEO and what that taught him about building successful products and companies. The early warning signs he saw that made it clear Foundation Capital needed to be reinvented. How Foundation rediscovered who they were and who they wanted to be as a team. How they changed the way they operated and made investment decisions to give in partners more latitude to invest in the ideas they thought could be massive companies in the years to come. How they began making crypto investments, which led to massive wins in Solana and Brave by making small bets and winning over LP support as the wins added up. And Steve shares how he makes investment decisions, why he thinks you have to balance a prepared mind with an open mind, and he shares his advice for anyone interested in becoming a venture capitalist. This is an incredible episode. You can find the show notes and text transcript at outlieracademy.com slash 120, that's 120, and you can learn more about Foundation Capital at foundationcapital.com or by following Foundation Cap on Twitter. Please enjoy my conversation with Steve Vassallo of Foundation Capital. Steve Vassallo, welcome to Outlier Academy. This has been a long time coming and I'm so thrilled to have you on. So thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Daniel. Great to be here. We've known each other quite a while. Um, I've been super fortunate to you know, have you as someone I can learn from uh, as an investor, as a builder. So I want to kind of start by just sharing your background with everyone listening. And I thought an interesting place to start, You know, part of this conversation is going to be transitioning from being a builder to a venture investor. So to start, can you just share kind of a sketch of your background and your early years at IDEO, at IDEO and some of your where your love of design and product comes from? Yeah, you bet. The quick bounce on on me and my background. So yeah, I grew up uh, just outside of Boston. I was uh, what ninth kid out of ten in a uh, you know big family, Irish Catholic, no TV. Went to undergrad back east, spent a year in Switzerland, and then came to California to get my master's degree in electromechanical engineering. And I thought I was going to be a university prof, just like my mom. And then my very first Friday at Stanford, I met David Kelly, the founder of IDEO. And, uh, you know, I think I sort of assumed up to that point that products uh, just like fell out of the sky or something, that, that there was no sort of like degree in product design that I knew of anyway. And so when I kind of discovered this, uh, I was just completely taken. And um, a couple of months later, David actually, after seeing my final project for this ME 101 class, which is sort of like, you know, the design division first, you know, kind of capstone course, or I should say sort of introductory course, uh, told me, he's like, well, you need to work at IDEO this summer. And so I didn't spent that summer and then the next five years really designing a whole bunch of things, um, products across lots of different sectors, everything from uh, hard products um, to, you know, software interfaces, um, a whole bunch of things, you know, furniture, Nike's for sunglasses, Cisco's for his voice over IP phones, anesthesia delivery devices, uh, McDonald's bun toasters. <laughs> I mean, it was, uh, it was everything and, uh, was really imprinted like a baby duck on how you go from a concept to a product, uh, that in, in many ways could be sort of category defining. So that was, that was for me a seminal experience after that, then went on to about four years at my, at my first startup, um, which was in the field of, uh, haptics or force feedback interfaces for consumer devices. And, then went back to Stanford and did a bunch of things afterwards. But no, IDEO was was just one of those just really extraordinary 
kind of bubbling cauldron of creativity places that, you know, I still look back uh, on with just incredibly fond memories. Yeah. You talked about, you touched on it, you know, very briefly at the beginning, growing up in an Irish Catholic house with no TV. Did that shape your interest in technology or how you think about technology? Does that, you know, influence you at all? Yeah, I was I was a tinkerer and a builder and, you know, the, the, the kid who was always kind of taking apart things, uh, putting them back together, sometimes kind of in ways that were uh, not always as as, uh, as as they were intended. And um, really into Legos, kind of started my own business, uh, which was my Steve Snowblowing business when I was still in middle, middle school, making my own print shop uh, business cards for that. And so... I think there was sort of a scrappiness about my family. I mean, we were kind of very much middle middle class, uh, and my mom was a university professor. My dad was a physician, and um, yeah, I just I loved to build. I loved to to kind of take things apart and put them back together and reconfigure them in ways that you know were were sort of for me um, a chance to kind of riff and and uh, and and kind of explore my creativity. Yeah. And I want to ask as well, too, I mean, you talked about going to Stanford and studying, I think it was electrical engineering uh, at the beginning or mechanical engineering. And yeah, then, electromechanical. You know, transitioning. Yep. Yep. Electromechanical. You know, and then transitioning, obviously, to I- IDEO where you're working on kind of full spectrum product. So there is some engineering portions of that. There's a lot of, you know, finding the right problem that you're solving, exploring the right solution, and then, you know, designing and bringing that to life. One of the questions I want to ask is for a lot of people, they have this kind of false sense that engineering and design are are two distinct separate categories and you know no, there's no correlation there's no skills that overlap obviously i don't think that's true i'm guessing you don't what's your take on that and and how engineering and design influence each other it's a great point and in fact you know i i was trained as uh, uh, as you said sort of as an electromechanical engineer and a roboticist actually and when i came to stanford i was you know i was studying engineering not product design there was a product design major and there was also a master's program um, and when I got to IDEO, I was an engineer. I was not uh, one of the designers. The designers were sort of typically doing uh, industrial design. And then we added human factors and interaction design. In fact, the term and the concept of interaction design was pioneered by Bill Moggridge, who was at IDEO at the time and who I worked very closely with. And there was this sort of sense um, that you were kind of either an engineer or a designer or a kind of an anthropologist or kind of an ethnographer or human factors person. But what was so cool about IDEO and, and this sort of became, I don't know, a sort of a term of art uh, for a while, this concept of these T-shaped people where you had this depth in one domain, um, but then you, that was the sort of the, you know, the vertical part of the T, but then you had this horizontal sort of respect and admiration for these other disciplines. And so you could kind of put a bunch of T-shaped people together who, who had depths in different areas, and then you would just make these just incredibly gifted teams that could sort of think and, and cross-pollinate uh, to other areas. And so as I think about myself as a product designer, I don't think that I uh, was strictly an engineer or strictly a person who was sort of thinking about human interface or interaction design. I sort of brought all that together. And I think in many ways, that's still how I see the world. I think the most interesting products and services are really usually living at the intersections between disciplines at the seams. And it's the individuals who can kind of take an idea for one area and bring it over to another that really unlocks some new user interface or some new approach or metaphor to how you use the product. And I see this over and over again. We saw this at IDEO. I've seen this in my venture career. Some of my most interesting companies are ones that really are kind of a combination of synthetic biology and large data or uh, semiconductors and systems with uh, compiler theory. And, you know, even our crypto investments, I sort of feel like are at the intersection of uh, enterprise infrastructure and next generation applications. So um, I really do believe in this concept of great products living in that kind of space in between or at the intersection of multiple disciplines. Yeah. You know, it also speaks to like hearing you say that here, you know, hearing you talk about IDEO, uh, you know, makes me think about interdisciplinary innovation. And one of the models that makes me think of a Santa Fe Institute, you know, which has pioneered this idea that if we want to discover new things, uh, rather than all explore our own little, you know, kind of vertical T-bars, we need to actually work together across disciplines to find new things. And obviously it's not surprising that that same equation works really well when you're company building, <laughs> you're trying to solve a novel problem. That's exactly right. It's it. You've got to bring a lot to piece together. I mean, I I write a um a column for Forbes, and every third or fourth post, I profile uh, these individuals that I call the missionary misfits. And so these are folks who are oftentimes trained in one area, uh, but then they 
see an opportunity in an adjacent space or maybe in a, an altogether different space and they bring their depth uh, into these other areas and again are oftentimes sort of unlocking innovations and ideas because of that sort of misfit nature they're not trying to sort of just mine one vertical um, seam of knowledge instead sort of weaving them together in really interesting and novel ways yeah that's fascinating i'm gonna have to put a pin in that and come back to it so i, I want to now talk about uh your you know kind of move from being a builder or a product builder, a company builder to venture investor. Because I think for a lot of people, anytime I interview someone, I mean, obviously investors don't typically, aren't typically born. They just want to do investing. You know, the best venture investors come come as company builders first, and then they kind of end up discovering investing and use investing along with their building skills to, I think, one, find really interesting opportunities, and then two, to be able to work with founders to really bring those to life. So one of the questions I want to ask was just, what was your journey of becoming a venture investor? Was that something that was always in the back of your mind? Was it more kind of serendipitous along your journey? How did that come about? And what was the origin story there? Yeah. So I, I never thought I would be an investor. Uh, it wasn't something I sought out. I did seek out uh, building things. And, and sort of for me, there were these sort of concentric circles. I started my career building products, uh, then building teams that build products. And to me, it felt like there was a, an obvious next step to build companies that you know build great teams that build great products and so that sort of fractalization if you will of of building of creation and the creative process was natural to me and so when i after my stint at um, this haptics company i was maybe i was sort of 10 years out uh, designing products at this time and i was like you know what i need a break and i want to kind of step back and 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 understand some of the pieces of the products that I had worked on at IDEO that made them successful and some of the things that I observed out in the world that um, were great products but were not successful as businesses. And um, so I had this sort of literally this Venn diagram. In fact, I joked with David Kelly years later that I had that sort of uh, the, the D school Venn diagram before the D school did, but sort of this intersection of of technology, of kind of you know human centered design and business. And so I actually went back to Stanford really as a sabbatical um, to kind of get if you will, as excited about business and business models as I was about designing products. And so um, when I was at Stanford, I was like, I was riffing on a hundred different ideas across uh, everything from mobility to clean energy and sustainability. And just as I was leaving business school, I was actually introduced to Mark Andreessen as a prospective angel investor for a project I was working on. This was now five and a half or so years before he started Andreessen Horowitz. And so he and I went to breakfast at the Palo Alto Creamery. And instead of me getting Mark's $100,000 angel check, he, uh, he got me as the first head of product and engineer at the company that, that went on to become Ning. So um, I did that for about uh, two, two and a half years. And then I decided I wanted to, I wanted to start my own thing. I was like, okay, my first startup, I was, I don't know, the 35th employee. And then at Ning, I was basically the first non-founder. And at this point, I was like, hey, I, I actually, I, I think I can do this. I think I can go uh, start my own thing. And so I joined actually Foundation. I was invited uh, to join as an entrepreneur in residence. I had a very active program. In fact, Foundation sort of invented this, this concept back in the late 90s. And so I was cooking away on my own idea. And in fact, bringing my kind of product mindset to venture creation. And after a few months, uh, they basically were like, hey, you keep bringing these cool ideas and people in why don't you think about joining as an investor? And I was like, nah, I don't really want to do that yet. I'm still interested in building. And then uh, another few months went by and I realized I was having more fun than I ever had. So it was really, um, it kind of snuck up on me. Um, I mean, I, I still, I love designing products. I love the creative process. Um, and so it was, it, was not, uh, it was not sort of an obvious thing for me to become an investor. But then I think as I began to work with founders, uh, my very first investment was in a company called Sunrun, a uh, solar, solar finance company. And you know, as I began to work with that team and help them go from quite literally um, you know, kind of zero to now public, public company, the largest independent uh, owner and operator of solar systems, you know, that was uh, 11 years on the board. I joined it when there wasn't even a board. It was four people and a really interesting idea. And that process of helping them and then being able to do that again and again and again with a whole bunch of other companies was for me just absolutely breathtaking. Um, and so uh, I didn't expect it, but it really has been, it has been just you know, kind of the fun of a lifetime. Yeah. It sounds serendipitous in many ways. Uh, it obviously makes total sense. 
Uh, but also, you know, a ton of serendipity to becoming an EIR and then switching over to a partner. One of the questions I want to ask is, you know, uh, there are many different types of investors. There are definitely investors that just write checks. There are investors that are incredibly hands-on. I know that you're more of the latter. And so I thought it would be interesting to kind of talk about or maybe help help us help give us some examples of how you work with companies. And so I don't know if that's Sunrun or if there's another example, but you know, it's not just writing a check. It's much more getting to know the team and then it's finding many, many ways to help them. And, and part of why I want to ask is, I mean, I very similarly, you know, started out my career as a designer. I now spend a lot of time doing investing and I find it thrilling because one, I get to help a number of teams as opposed to just being focused on one problem. And I also get to learn an incredible amount from the people that I'm working with. And so it's this like wonderful two-way street. How do you think about, you know, your like the building role of being an investor and what do you get out of that? Yeah. So I, and this is how I think you and I met was that sort of intersection of, of sort of our, our kind of the optimistic um, sort of, you know, kind of infinite possibilities of, of building things. And I think, you know, building and creation is a fundamentally optimistic endeavor of going from, what is to what ought to be. And that to me is the funnest part of working with these founders. And I think maybe the best example of that of recent would be the work that I did with uh, Andrew Feldman and his co-founders at a company called Cerebrus. Uh, Cerebrus is a a semiconductor and systems company that really pioneered uh, some interesting technology to build basically purpose-built systems for AI workloads. So back in kind of 2015 timeframe, um, I and one of my partners had been been really studying what was going on um, with big data and and the use of machine learning models, not just at some of the sort of you know massive web scale companies like uh, Google and Amazon and Facebook, but we were beginning to see in the mid market our, our own portfolio companies, uh, some of our ad tech companies, even e commerce companies, beginning to use machine learning to build better products, um, to build algorithms that were um, going to be much, much better than kind of their kind of hard-coded, if you will, sort of more software-driven rather than data-driven alternatives. And so I worked very closely with that team. In fact, I had met Andrew when he was raising money for his prior company, Um, loved him, but didn't love that idea and stayed close to it and um, did what I often do when, you know, founders come across my radar uh, that you know where we don't converge, but I knew as soon as um, that company was done or he was he was uh, going to be done with it that I would want to back his next thing or at least be in the kind of the running to do that. And so his company, that last company, was acquired by AMD. I talked with him around the time it was getting acquired. Kind of did set the proverbial egg timer for two years, knowing that he would pop out at some point. And um, and then over that two year period, kind of riffed on half a dozen different ideas until he converged on building this sort of purpose built systems for AI workloads. And in that, even in that two years, those AI workloads were on a just full on vertical growth trajectory. In fact, I mean those uh, the AI workloads. We're basically outstripping Moore's law by a factor of you know by a factor of twenty five thousand x right. So anyway, so he kind of got 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 involved in this. And so what was my role in that? Well, we we riffed on a lot of ideas. We actually hosted them at our office in in uh, in Menlo Park. Um, we uh, have helped hire. I have personally probably helped close close to two hundred of his candidates. Of his of his, some, these are the sort of the super hard to find. Um, really, really. Um, special uh, deep learning experts uh, coming from all over the world. I think we now have more than 36 countries represented on the team across four different geographies. And so um, just working really closely with him. And also when stuff got really hard, I mean, there were moments when we weren't sure that the thing was going to work. And so really kind of working with him and rolling up your sleeves, um, engaging him in those some of those hard problems where I might uh, in my network be able to bring to bear um, some unique resources, uh, and this was definitely the case in the first couple of years that could that could really help him out. So anyway, that was for me that was uh, a, a chance to really dig in and get involved and be helpful uh, in ways that I'm not sure other folks who don't come from sort of more technical domains uh, would have been, would have been able to do. 
I mean, that's an incredible overview. You know, thank you for sharing. Just the stat of helping hire 200 candidates is insane. That's that's hard to hard to fathom. I feel like most people haven't even interviewed 200 candidates. Uh, you know, decades into their career. I want to transition now and, and talk about foundation and a little bit bit about the cycle of rebirth and kind of reimagination that's happened there over the last 15 years. Part of why I was so excited to have this conversation is you've been a foundation for 15 years, and I always love talking with people that have this wealth of experience because. Because I think it's just a very different purview. You know, you've been able to witness many different cycles. You've been able to witness many different trends play out. You've been able to witness, you know, uh, changes in the market, changes in dynamics, uh, changes in technology, all while being kind of in this eye of the storm as this is going on. And so what, what I wanted to start with, and then we'll kind of unravel the onion, you know, bit by bit. But what I wanted to start with is take us back 15 years ago to when you first joined foundation and talk a little bit about what it was like there at that time. And then I think it would be interesting too, if you could share a little bit of what do you feel like has changed the most at a high level um, over those 15 years, even just a quick comparison of kind of what stands out as you think about it quickly. Goodness. Yeah. And it's uh, a lot has changed. I'm, I'm, I'm sure every 15 year window, people sort of feel that way, but boy, it, it, it felt like just massive transformation. I mean, when I, when I joined foundation, it did feel like many folks in the venture industry were really doing, I don't know, a victory lap on their operating careers. That's probably more pejorative than I mean it to be. But there was a lot of folks who kind of had worked as operators for maybe 15, 20, 25 years. And then, you know, we're like, hey, like now it's time to be a venture investor. And I think the foundation had a bit of that. There were our three founders actually had had been investors most of their career, but uh, many of the other individuals were more kind of like former operators. And I think there was uh, a challenge in that is time scales. I sort of feel like, you know, there was a, um, you know, weeks or months. Uh, and, and by the way, the, the industry, the entrepreneurial ecosystem was very much moving at a slower pace at this time, but, but you could take your time uh, to get to know a company. And even if you think about the kinds of people you were investing in, they were in many cases, uh, a subset of the folks that you had worked with in your operating career, people that you already knew, maybe they were one degree away. And the challenge of that, of course, is it, it reinforces the biases and the behaviors. But in my opinion, it really overlooks opportunity and drives down returns. I mean, I remember chatting with Bill Joy, who my, my wife worked with for more than a decade, um, and he was the co-founder's son. And he, he had uh, coined this idea, which of, uh, of course now is known as Joy's Law, but it was this concept that no matter who you are, most of the smartest people in the world work for somebody else. And so what, what I realized was like, oh no, like if I'm going to be successful not just a foundation, but in this business, you got to go find the best entrepreneurs. You got to go build a brand uh, that's so strong that they want to come to you. And then when you do find those special entrepreneurs, um, you got to move extremely quickly. And unless you're willing to sacrifice the quality of your decision making, you got to then specialize because the only way to move fast and move uh, towards projects that are going to work out is if you have some degree of focus. And so really, I think what foundation has become, and I think the industry has become, is people move much more quickly. They're in general not trying to be everything to everyone. Um, and foundation certainly is this is this way. Uh, there are a few platforms maybe that work across pretty much everything. But you know, we hear foundation, we want to back, back the best entrepreneurs in our core areas of expertise. Um, and that's enterprise up and down the stack. Uh, that's fintech and insure tech. And that's, and that's crypto and Web3. And outside of those areas, we'll definitely experiment. We have this sort of, I have this sort of belief around this concept of what I call the balance between the prepared mind and the open mind. And so we'll, we'll definitely uh, kind of go off road from those areas and we'll add a new practice area kind of every handful of years as we kind of demonstrate um, that expertise and, and, and demonstrate success in the form of great, great portfolio companies. Um, but we really want to be really sharp. We want to we want to be able to make good decisions. We want to be able to help those entrepreneurs out of the gate. We want to be able to help them close candidates, 200 of them. We want to be able to help them find their next investors. We want to help them um, kind of do everything they need to do to be successful. And I think that requires a lot, a lot more focus, a lot more specialization. Yeah. One of the questions that I wanted to ask is, uh, you know, when you think about a 15 year time period, uh, it, you know, it makes me think of like one of the best books I read that's kind of a retrospective on venture capital recently is The Power Law. And one of the things you, re- you know, kind of learn reading through that book is one, the origins of many 
venture firms that are still around today, but, you know, frankly, are kind of a shell of their former selves. And these are firms mostly that were founded in the 50, you know, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. But one of the things you learn, which is obviously intuitive, is it takes an enormous amount of innovation and uh, persistence and, you know, curiosity and just an enormous amount of work to persist in the industry for even five years, let alone 10 years or 15 years, uh, you know, just being super frank. And so one of the things I wanted to ask was clearly over the last, say, 10, 15 years, foundation has gone through a massive rebirth. You know, even just talking about one of your focus areas being being crypto and Web3, it's very novel. There's not many venture firms that I know of that do enterprise and also do crypto and Web3, I think, in the way that you guys have been able to do it. So I want to ask, as you think about kind of the rebirth or the reimagination of foundation over the last 10 years, was there a clear starting point? Was there a a kind of nagging sense one day that this showed up? Was this kind of a line in the sand moment? Was it gradual? Talk to us about how that, how you felt that and then how that ended up playing out, kind of rethinking. Yeah. So I joined just at the beginning of our sixth fund, uh, which uh, was, I think they closed it maybe the spring after I joined and was very large, $750 million vehicle, still early stage or aspirations of going to new geographies, new strategies, later stage. And even though the firm was sort of historically early stage and about halfway through that investment period. And I think we were, I was sort of uh, beginning to absorb some of the sort of performance numbers from the prior funds. Maybe it was the third, fourth, and fifth funds that were beginning to kind of like mature enough that you could kind of get a sense for what their performance would look like. And I was a kind of a lowly principal at the time, but, you know, I bear witness to these performance numbers during annual meetings and, and quarterly catch-ups. And, and I'd look at these things, I'd be like, oh boy, I, I don't think those numbers are that good, but, you know, I'm the junior person, so I'll just keep my mouth shut and, uh, and just go try to find great projects. And so, but about halfway through fund six, as the team was beginning to contemplate the next fund, it was clear that our limited partners were kind of asking the hard questions of the prior funds. So this is, you know, before I joined, but, you know, those, those earlier vintages and they weren't good enough. Um, and so, you know, it, it wasn't one of those sort of nagging, like, did this kind of sneak up on you thing? It was like, Actually, two thirds of our limited partners fired us, and um, and that was you know that was kind of one of those really challenging moments. I mean, I think um, I think back on it, and you know, I'm not a founder of this firm, and neither of the uh, n- neither are the two other uh, partners that I worked with to kind of help turn it around. But there, there was this founding moment, really, like so many of our startups experience, where you know you're kind of questioning whether this thing is going to work, um, whether you uh, should you know, sort of go start something de novo. And so basically we had to kind of go through this very hard process of downsizing the team, resetting the strategy and really rebuilding our LP base. And this was back uh, really starting in 2011. And um, that was really hard work. And I think, you know, as you said, there there are some franchises in our business um, that have been able to manage generational transition, but the vast majority do not. In fact, uh, the vast majority... um, you know, I think, beca- you know, fall prey to, you know, founders who don't want to let go, uh, uh, economics that get trapped in the most senior uh, partners and a next generation that doesn't feel motivated to go out and find great projects and to win. But we got, with some help from our LPs, we got a core base of investors who said, you know what, you guys are doing great work. Um, and in fact, we would literally take our fund six portfolio and we sort of showed them what the up and comer uh, partners portfolios looked like and they gave us um they 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 looked at it they saw good good work uh, and they gave us the benefit of the doubt to to keep going and that core group of lps have been incredibly well rewarded for that risk they took on us back in uh, in really the fund eight time frame so anyway so that was it was it was it was a hard thing to make work um i'm not sure i would do it again or would wish it upon someone else but we made it happen and i think what i'm most proud of now and in fact i remember one of our one of our lps who was kind of re-underwriting us in that fund eight window said to me he said well we think about you guys as this really interesting blend between a established brand 
and an emerging manager. And as he said it, I was like, oh, that sounds, I don't know, I'm not sure I, I like that. And he said, well, wh- what we're worried about with our established brands is, are they relevant anymore? You know, are the next generation of investors, do they want to join those platforms? And what we're worried about with our emerging managers, they're, they've never lived through a downturn. They don't know what it looks like when markets are in free fall, not for, you know, a week or a month, but like a year or two years. And so we really, as a group, we bring all of that together. And um, uh, so anyway, I think, I think it's, it's turned out to be a blessing in disguise, um, but it was a ton of work to make, it, to make it happen. I mean, you talk about that process of obviously letting the team go, downsizing, you have, you know, having LPs uh, you know, fire you, basically going and having to convince some LPs or a base of LPs to take a bet on you. And it immediately makes me think of obviously, you know, many founders go through that at some point in time, like one of, one of my favorite adages, um, and I, you know, I've shared this with, with founders that are going through really tough times and it's maybe their first time going through one is, you know, companies are built in chapters. Like I witnessed that myself firsthand when I was at Square, where Square today is a wonderfully successful uh, company at many point in times, it did not feel like it was going to be successful. And that is true for every enormously successful company. And so one of the questions I want to ask was one, when you were going through that period, what made it bearable? What did you keep in mind that allowed you to keep pushing through? And I guess, what did you learn from that, that, you know, has helped you be more empathetic or sympathetic for founders that similarly have to make really difficult decisions sometimes to save the business? No, and it gets back to that sort of founding moment, right? Like we're not necessarily founders, but we experience these founding moments that kind of call into question everything you thought you knew or believed about, about your business. But I think what, what we focused on through that transitional period was what was working well. And then, you know, I think, you know, with, with our founders, it's the same thing, which is double down on the things that are working on your strengths and do less of the things that aren't. And, you know, I think the things that were working for us was this notion of going deep, of becoming truly expert in a few number of areas where founders would seek us out, where they would have a meeting with us. And after the meeting say, wow, you guys asked me questions or you offered me introductions or you suggested something that changed the course of my, of, of my thinking. And so we went deep. And then the other piece was when, when your partners go deep and they do the work, as it were, you have a much easier time trusting them. You trust them to make great decisions they're not necessarily the same decisions you would make. In fact, you end up kind of embracing that differentiation and appreciating it over time. But if you know they're doing the work, if you know they're doing the, the, the diligence and talking to the customers and really understanding the technologies and the risks, if you know their diligence shovels are hitting bedrock when they do the work, you're like, yeah, I trust you. I, I think you should go do this. And so I think we focused on what was working and we kind of got we got rid of all the the stuff that was sort of felt more political. In fact, we changed the way we vote on projects. So in the old days, there was a sort of very consensus-driven approach to voting, uh, meaning to sort of investment com- committee decisions, if you will, where you did have veto power. Very few folks used the veto power. But there was a sort of averaging effect where you kind of had to get everybody on board. And if you had it was a four-point voting system. If you had two twos, it would kill a project. And threes were sort of like, you know, supportive, but, you know, maybe I wouldn't do it. And, and so you ended up with this kind of like, you know, bowl of oatmeal kind of mush decision. And instead, we moved towards uh, a more conviction-based approach. And votes were still there. You still wanted to get the feedback of your partners, but they were purely advisory. Uh, and so because they were advisory, I could be more open about um, the concerns that I had. I could tell you straight up, Daniel, I think the distribution is going to be a really hard problem for these guys to get, or customer acquisition is going to be a real challenge, or that founder doesn't seem like they're going to be able to scale. And so uh, instead of you feeling like you had to kind of go manage or kind of machine the interactions with your partners, you basically had to, you, you went and, and did the work and built conviction. And if you didn't, you didn't do the project. So, um, so anyway, so th- those were some of the things that I think um, got us through the hard times. Yeah, it's fascinating. And obviously, you know, something as simple as focusing on what what's work. It sounds so simple almost to be t- pedestrian, but obviously there's something kind of brilliant there because I, f- I feel like in those moments, one of the things you need as a team, as an individual is just to get back in a positive feedback loop. You want to feel like you're winning or making progress or putting one step in the for- you know, in front of the other in, in some small way. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, clearly, you know, so at these founding moments, same thing is true whenever you're founding a company. Um, 
you know, there's difficult, there's a lot of difficult decisions, but obviously you, you need enormous conviction about where you're headed. And so one of the questions I want to ask is clearly, I imagine you and the two other partners that were basically saying, okay, we're going to take this thing and kind of rebuild it and reimagine it. You all three had to get on the same page about where you were going. What was that process like? And, and what, uh, I don't know, like walk us through the iterations that it took you to get there. Because I guess what I'm curious is, you know, clearly you talk about, uh, like, I think that voting, the voting mechanics you just described, so simple, obviously really profound. Did that similar kind of where we want to head show up in a thesis change? Did it show up in, how, you know, what you were looking at? How else did that manifest itself? Yeah. So we had, I, 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 I remember uh, it was a, a, a partner who joined us, maybe 2014 timeframe, uh, Joanne, and she made the comment. She's like, why wow, you guys spend a lot of time at these quarterly offsites. And we actually uh, once a year do just uh, kind of the core team offsite and then uh, another kind of two to three times a year do offsites with the full investing team. And we spend a lot of time together thinking about uh, what it is we want to spend our time on, meaning as a, as a firm, what are the, uh, the themes and the areas um, of focus and when do we kind of promote one to get more resources? When do we feel like one's maybe run its course and we'll continue to sort of see everything that's, um, you know, that's, that's sort of happening in that space, but maybe we kind of deprioritize it a bit. And, and so I think we would spend time in those offsites uh, really trying to figure out what, what was the strategy we wanted to go forward. And, and I think as a product person to come to, back to that for, uh, for a minute, and I, you know, for you and I suspect many of your listeners who are also product people might appreciate that we really did think about how could you build a repeatable process um, in venture, which sounds kind of crazy because it's in some senses almost idiosyncratic. But what we do in our practice areas is we build what I call our points of view, right? Like it's it's as if you were going to go start a company as an investor, even sort of incubate one. You've got to go do a lot of work. You've got to do this foundational research. You're taking many meetings with you know entrepreneurs and advisors and the smartest people you know in these areas. And after you've kind of interacted with and immersed yourself in this, in this primary data, we begin to kind of synthesize our own perspective, our own sort of point of view um, on the opportunity space. And that then turns into what we think about as sort of these investable insights. Um, these are the subsectors that we like, the neighborhoods, if you will, uh, that we think a good investment would land in. What are the attributes in many ways of a good investment? So that before that founder walks in our door or hops onto the Zoom with us, we almost already know what we're looking for. Now, it's, it's never exactly the thing that we had on a whiteboard or in, a, in kind of a, a, a presentation that we might, might give to each other or to our limited partners, but you know, it's, it's got a lot of those elements. And that, that gets back to that sort of prepared mind, open mind tension. And so when we do that hard work um, and build those points of view, I think we just come at the categories that we're um, that we're going deep in, in a much better spot. And those founders, I think, appreciate that depth. And so we, we spent a lot more time working on that. And as I said, decision-making was a big part of that. And, and pairing kind of that depth and that focus uh, allowed us to move faster. And so we committed to each other, um, those things. And then the other thing, uh, and we've been even doubling down on this of recent, is is getting even better about how we bring kind of the next generation on. So we've, I kind of uh, maybe four or five years ago went down the the rabbit hole of conscious leadership and uh, started kind of going uh, and and tr and trying to sort of educate myself and now actually work with a coach uh, in this area who who is then going to work with uh, our broader team on all the different ways that we can work with each other and help each other be better partners so that we can elevate each other's games so that we can kind of bring the best out of uh, our partners and 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 communicate even better not just with each other but with our founders and our CEOs. So anyway, we really have invested in that depth, in that decision making and in that uh, ability to have open conversations. Yeah. I mean, to recap, it sounds like you really invested in all the aspects to make a partnership truly work. Because I think, you know, in venture, it's interesting. Clearly, you have a lot of competitive, even if they're just competitive with themselves, competitive people that are showing up, that are have ideas about what's interesting, what's what maybe you should be investing in, what areas you should be looking in. And it's a very different thing to take a team-based approach and one, really invest in foundational, same language, same perspective, same points of view about who you're looking for. So you're all on the same page. But then as you as you talked about, you know, the like soft, mushy 
glue of just human connection that keeps you all trusting one another, leaning into one another, you know, and actually working as a well-functioning team, which is often just not very, you know, talked about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, and it's mostly overlooked in our business for sure. Yeah. One of the questions I want to ask was around when, you know, so clear you go through this reboot, did it, was there a moment in time where you felt like it was clearly working and how did you monitor that? How did you know? So you set out, you know, you kind of look at these old vintage returns, clearly know that something's not working. You go through this crucible moment, this founding moment of this really difficult time to reboot it and head in this new direction. When did you know it was working and what were some early clues that you kind of picked up along the way? Well, so one of the hard things about our business is I, I think v- venture time constants are very long. <laughs> um, but what I think gives you some confidence that you're moving in the right direction is that within about, I'd say, sort of 12 to 18 months into our fund date investing period. So this is kind of like end of 2015, beginning of 2016. We were beginning to see nice markups um, from firms that we respect. We were feeling like more and more founders were seeking us out. Um, and then ultimately, of course, it, it becomes manifest in, in, in the companies that you invest in and then the real returns that you deliver uh, in the form of you know, uh, distributions to paid in capital. So I think um, it was those, those early mile markers were really those markups. And, um, and I think that, that definitely helped. Um, and, I, and I also feel like, we kept as well, at, you know, even as that stuff was coming in and we were starting to feel better, we kept looking a little bit further further out on the horizon and, and saying, okay, well, what do we need to do to keep getting better? And I think when you have a long enough focal length, you can weather the near-term ups and downs, um, you know, the markets uh, kind of doing their crazy things and stay focused on, again, on the things that you're doing well. And so, you know, I think so much of building something really hard is is just showing up every day and doing the thing that you committed to. And so I'd say, yeah, back, I'd say kind of 2016, we're kind of, you know, we're back to our fighting weight. The core team's really gelling. We'd added some new folks who are really fired up. We're getting into some great projects and, um, and kind of being beginning to be known for, for, for being, you know, leaders in those, in those areas where we, where we spike really hard. Yeah. One of the kind of aspects of, uh, you know, this transition of foundation that I find really interesting is this move into crypto and Web3. And, you know, one, I, I think it would be helpful to start because I'm not sure how many people know just how prolific and how successful you guys have, have been there because it was somewhat surprising to me as I was digging in. Talk a little bit about one you know, when you got interested in crypto and why you got interested in crypto, and then just at a high level, some of the investments you've made to date, and then we'll kind of double click and go a couple levels deeper. Yeah. So really the beginning of our interest in and around blockchain crypto um, went back to 2013, 2014 timeframe. And it really started with, um, so one of our, one of those up and comers who joined us uh, in that crucible moment where we were kind of rebuilding uh, the firm, Rodolfo, you know, he was the first one to kind of fall down the rabbit hole. Um, he's originally from Mexico City. Uh, prior to foundation, he had worked in uh, financial services at McKinsey, focused on their emerging markets. And he was immediately struck by the potential for uh, cryptocurrencies to disintermediate all the traditional financial institutions that basically weren't trusted in uh, in Mexico and in Latin America more broadly. Um, you know, you had this sort of you know entire continent, uh, hundreds of millions of people who didn't trust uh, institutions, who were constantly worried about debasement of their currency, worried about corruption, experienced just just insanely high transaction fees when you know when 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 their family would uh, you know go to the states and send money back, um, and so. He really, I think, was connected to and resonated with that as sort of the promise for me, which and I, I started investing in the space uh, a couple of years later. The lens for me was actually pretty different. It was, it, was, uh, it was getting excited about the wicked problems that needed to be solved in order to build you know, these permissionless, highly distributed, secure, but still needed to be fast systems like that just... That to me lit up all of my kind of nerdy electromechanical distributed systems neurons, uh, many of which I sort of you know engaged in in building companies uh, you know as an entrepreneur, and so um, I got really taken by that. 
And so um, it was it was really the intersection of of the sort of like solving hard problems, but that also had meaningful use cases. Um, and and that's what I think got us going. And and then we, I mean, one of our first investments was in Brave, which is a browser company. Probably many of you and your users have experienced using that. And, and I've known Brendan since 1995, 96 timeframe, uh, extraordinary, brilliant uh, founder and builder, inventor of JavaScript, uh, co-founder of Mozilla, <laughs> um, uh, just ferociously smart human who's who's been on this mission to sort of address privacy and and uh, and usability and get rid of ads and sort of broken business models um, like like that are so pervasive in ad tech. And then we were early investors in OpenSea uh, as they were graduating from from YC. We were among the first investors in Algorand, uh, extraordinary team out of MIT. Then Blockstacks, Solana. We were among their first venture investors in March of 2018, uh, and then again in September of 2018. The you know, world was getting very dark in crypto land in 2018. For for those of you who might remember, uh, then we wrote another check into Solana in 2019. In fact, we we invested in every or purchased tokens in every round there uh, prior to their mainnet launch uh, in 2020. So, very very um, you know early conviction um, in in some technologies that I think are are really transforming that space. And there's another 35 or 40 investments behind those. But those are some of the earliest ones. And I think maybe one last point um, is, you know, you, you said it's sort of unusual for a firm like ours that has, you know, this experiences in in enterprise and in fintech to then kind of lean into crypto. In many ways, it was an extension of those practice areas. So, I mean, when I think back on the thesis in Solana, I could have looked at it just as much as an enterprise infrastructure company. I mean, that team uh, has just extraordinary technical chops really around building highly distributed systems initially inspired by, you know, TDMA algorithms applied to highly constrained networks, cellular networks, now sort of, you know, being applied to highly constrained blockchains. Um, You know, that team could you know could very easily be uh, characterized as you know among the best sort of infrastructure engineers uh, just happen to be focused on you know on this new and emerging area of crypto so um, and and same thing with some of the the fintech applications in DeFi I mean the fact that we have been working in and around traditional finance for two and a half decades and that we understand what's what works and bluntly where those companies and categories need to be completely reinvented where there's a sort of opportunity for a complete replatforming of those technologies. We know that really well because we've been investing in it. So I think the fact that we bring some of that history and, and understanding has actually made us better investors in, in some of those crypto projects, particularly in those verticals. Yeah. Well, I'm not surprised by that at all, but I do think you deserve more credit because I think, you know, my take, or at least my perspective is I think a lot of, it seems like in your case, you were able to look through, look past the crypto label and really understand one, the problems they were solving, which for anyone that's problem focused, if you just look at what it takes to build incredibly fast decentralized infrastructure, like what Solana's done, it is in insane. You know, it's an insane, massive orders of magnitude problem to be able to solve that. Um, so if you look through and understand the technical problems they're solving and, you know, the problem spaces that they're working in and just the technology that they're building, I think you clearly have a very differentiated point of view. But part of why I wanted to ask that was, you know, I guess one of the things I'm curious about is, you know, and this is more anecdotal than anything else, but something, a sense that I get is that a lot of institutional investors still, one, don't quite understand crypto and two, aren't super comfortable with it. And I think that's partially because, you know, there's this age old debate, like, is it replacing finance? Is it, is it the new version of finance? Is it an alternate universe that just enables different things? And I want to get into that in a second. But one of the questions I want to ask was how did, you know, did you have to actively go about making the case to invest in crypto to your LPs? And what was that conversation like to try to get them up to speed and comfortable? Yeah. So uh, it's a great question. And I think in general, what I've learned in 15 years in our business is, uh, it's definitely a forgiveness, not per- permission kind of narrative. And so, you know, if you were ex ante asking uh, LPs, and, and I, I remember uh, several of them back in the kind of 2015 time time zone, but like when we'd give our updates, you know, they think we were kind of completely off the wagon, just like you guys are investing in these kind of uh, libertarian nut jobs, lots of speculators and mercenaries. And so bluntly, we just, we, we didn't ask them for permission. We basically said, okay, we're going to make 
a number of, uh, it wasn't small, but it was sort of 25-ish investments in that first fund where we, where we kind of really uh, got focused on crypto. And we made, we made smaller investments. So the way I think about these things is it's sort of a, a bet sizing exercise when you're, when you're investing in these emerging areas. And so, you know, our investments in, in Solana, I mean, it was two and a half million dollars uh, over the course of three rounds. So that's tiny compared to some of the other investments we were making uh, in other infrastructure companies. And that was also the case for, you know, Algorand and, and, and OpenSea and Brave and, and others. And so what we did is we basically made smaller investments that in aggregate totaled uh, a single core investment out of our fund eight portfolio. Um, and so we managed risk on the cost basis perspective, but then turned, you know, that call it sort of $20 million into five or 6 billion. So, um, so, so I, I think with LPs in general, you're not advertising th- the kind of sh- the shiny new thing that sounds really scary until after you've proven that you were successful at doing it. And, um, and that's worked out pretty well for us. I, I mean, I, I, I do think even today though, there are institutional investors who look at crypto and think, um, you know, this, this, this whole thing, you know, still hasn't proven its wares in terms of use cases for, uh, for, you know, enterprises or end consumers still has a lot to prove. And, and, you know, I think that's, I think that's fair feedback, but I think much of the same could have been said about, you know, the web in 1995 or 96. And I, I still remember using the mosaic browser in my office over the San, you know, Stanford center for design research. And it, it wasn't casually obvious that, you know, Google was going to be built on top of that or, uh, or Facebook or 15 years later, Uber for that matter. So I still think we're in those early, early days um, where you're, you're, you know, you're kind of trusting that um, the, these new technologies are going to then light up applications that you could have never conceived of ex ante. Yeah. Well, I also think that's the purpose of venture. You know, venture is not meant to be investing in things that are 100% proven with certainty because then all the returns are gone. You want, you have to do this perpetually uncomfortable exercise of investing in the things that today seem under underbaked, you know, somewhat somewhat sketchy or hard to imagine what this future might look like. That is literally where you should be putting those dollars to work. But I love the mechanics of, yeah, not asking for permission, starting with small bet sizing. And clearly, you know, one of the things you proved is uh, you can still start with small bet sizes and still make incredible returns if you make good bets <laughs> at those small sizes. Yeah. Well, this is, an, this is a part of our, our world where there are you know, thousand x, two thousand x returns, and um, that's uh, that doesn't happen every five years in the venture ecosystem. And so we love that asymmetry uh, of opportunity. Yeah, I want to go back to something you talked about of prepared mind versus open mind. One, you know, could you maybe flesh that out a little bit more and talk about? how that's shown up or how you push that forward. You know, I, I know you've brought on a lot of younger partners. I'm imagining this prepared mind versus open mind is still playing out even today in conversations you're having. But I also imagine that, you know, these initial investments in crypto were probably a prime example of prepared mind versus open mind. So talk a little bit about that principle and how it showed up. Yeah. So the prepared mind kind of gets back to this concept of going deep, building these sort of, you know, points of view, almost as if you were, you were going to start a company, build a company uh, from scratch in in one of those areas, and that looks more like you know what I used to do as a as a product designer, as a product manager, um, not as an investor. And I you know I think few folks actually approach uh, the venture industry that way. But uh, you know I mean, in spite of all the time we spend doing that, uh, you know the time we spend getting you know smart in specific areas, um, we we also acknowledge that some of our best investments emerge through. A collision of accidents of meeting the right people when you know they're kind of looking for some help that you know we we think we can kind of uniquely um, assist them with, and so I think that the ambition to sort of have some points of view to kind of put some stakes in the ground to publish your ideas. I mean, when I worked on the way to design my book, I was sort of putting myself out there. I was I was I was talking to fifty designer founders. I was sharing some things that were hypotheses that I had about kind of um, you know a, a time for designer founders to really kind of begin to kind of take the reins of 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 great entrepreneurial endeavors. And so, you know, w- whether it's in the form of a book or uh, a talk at a you know a tech crunch uh, conference or um, you know, a, a blog post or an article for Forbes, I think we were putting ourselves out there. That's the sort of ambitious part. But then there's a humility in our business, which is knowing that we 
we aren't the ones building the future. We're the passengers here uh, and the facilitators with capital and with time and with focus and feedback and concentrated effort, but we aren't the ones who are going to kind of go build that from zero to one. And so I think that's the, that's the open mind part of it. Uh, the prepared mind is the work we do to kind of, in some senses, attract those entrepreneurs to have the first conversation, but then the open mind is, is the humility part of our business. Yeah. And you need both, you know, I think to, to one spot, interesting opportunities that are overlooked or, uh, you know, not recognized by others on, on kind of the radar screen. And I, you know, I think you need both in order to one, it was part of, again, going back to why I was so interested in having this conversation. My experience is it takes both of those to be able to survive and thrive over multi-decade timeframes. And so I imagine that's been an important part of helping foundation be so successful. I want to ask, I want to kind of close out by, I guess, asking a couple of, um, I don't know, lessons learned, ahas, things you've learned over the last 15 years. And one of the ones I wanted to start with, I mean, you talked about at the at the beginning, some of the biggest changes you've observed. What are the biggest things that you as an individual, as an investor have learned that have either been surprising to you or counterintuitive um, that, you know, you, you kind of picked up at some point in time, but things that you didn't necessarily think of or know when you became an investor. So things you've picked up on the job over the last 15 years. I think I began to know this just as I was starting here at Foundation, but boy, it has been underlined and highlighted and bold a uh, hundred times since, is, is really this sense that the best product matters, but it is not what defines a, a generationally important company. Um, and it's very humbling for me to say that as a product person. Uh, I remember, you know, there's this sort of ethos of the Stanford product design program and at IDEO in particular of the best idea wins. And I remember even at IDEO seeing, um, you know, companies uh, that competed with some of the ones that we were, you know, where we were working on a product for, you know, one client or another, and we would see some competing product be wildly successful in the market, but it was, it was, it was a steaming pile of turd. And we'd say like, well, wait a minute, like what's going on there? And what I began to appreciate, and I think today is, is, is more clear than ever, is distribution matters so much more than I think us product people appreciate in those early days. And, you know, there's often kind of a distribution hack that some startup will use to kind of get going. And, you know, figuring out how you kind of bootstrap and not just build a great product, because I really do believe, well, if you're, if you're going to work on something, you might as well work on something hard and you might as well do it extraordinarily well. Um, but boy, you better think about distribution and you better think about, you know, uh, not necessarily from day zero, but your business model has to be something that is top of mind. Maybe you choose to sort of put it kind of on a back burner in the early days, but um, but I do think that like that sensitivity to uh, go to market, to how you acquire your customers, how they find you, um, and how you kind of ultimately build a wildly profitable business is something that is you know is just completely obvious to me today that wasn't maybe fifteen or twenty years ago. Well, totally. I mean, you know, as someone who I uh, spent many years of my career as a designer, you know, it's difficult to hear because you think that if you just design it better than anyone else, if you build it better than anyone else, that it's going to naturally take off. And I think, you know, maybe it's a different way of saying what you've just said, but I think the lesson I've learned is the world's best companies really live in a superposition where one, they're pervasively excellent in many, many, many areas. And that, you know, it really does, I think, take excellence, not just in design and engineering, but in distribution and in finance and in fundraising and in marketing, <laughs> you know, and you can go down the list to create something that is, you know, much bigger than the sum um, of the parts. One of the questions I want to ask around the way to design is, you know, maybe one or two things that were surprising that you learned doing that, um, you know, and so to kind of recap it for that book, you went out and interviewed, I think it was at least 50, 50 plus founders, designers, uh, you know, you had some kind of theses, hypotheses heading into there, you go and have these all, all these conversations, what were the most uh, surprising deltas, you know, things you believed heading into that project that you <laughs> changed your mind on by the time the book was out and, and you know published. A couple things. This will maybe sound more negative than I mean it to, but I feel like so much um, of the culture in Silicon Valley is, you know, there's sort of these like you know tag phrases that we have around things like, I mean, uh, I'm I'm not a huge fan of minimum viable product. Um, I remember when I interviewed Joe Gebbia, co-founder of of Airbnb, for the book, um, kind of just 
riffing with him. We were at an offsite um, somewhere up in Marin and and uh, riffing with him on this concept of um, what I talk about in the book is the minimum awesome product. Um, you know, he thinks about products as the first time you use a product as kind of a first date. And if you were kind of to finish your first date and you're like, hey, how was the date? And she said, uh, oh, it was, that was minimally viable. You'd be like, that sucked. <laughs> like, what did I do wrong? <laughs> I guess we're done. It doesn't work. And so I think we fall prey to these sort of, you know, tagline, meme kind of product things. And I mean, even, you know, so much of, um, you know, kind of design thinking, I think has sort of been shortcut or shorthanded into things that are kind of maybe easy to describe. Um, and so I don't think we, I don't think we really understand them as deeply, but I'd say that probably the one that I think became so clear to me in the process of writing the book uh, and is probably sort of obvious now in retrospect, but was sort of this concept of product market fit as this sort of static thing. And I think in the Valley, we talk about it like... It's like a level in a game. To be- yeah, it's exactly. It's like a level. <laughs> uh, you you get it as soon as you get it. You like, then you kind of, you know, triple your marketing budget and you double down on your ad spend and and it's like you found it, you know, between the couch cushions, and um, and it's not that. It is very dynamic, and I think it gets back to your, you know, the conversation we were having around how how to reinvent yourself, how to sort of think through those kind of founding moments. And I, the way I think about product market fit is it is a liquid. It's not a solid. And what I mean by that is, look, achieving product market fit is it's a great thing, right? A lot of companies never get there, but but it's a transitory achievement. Um, it's 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 a false summit, and that's because like you know, competitive landscape changes. Your customers end up wanting more. The technology shifts, and it enables new features and functionality. And so, the goal really is not to achieve product market fit, but rather to achieve um, kind of a drumbeat of regular and repeated product market fits. And I think companies who do that well are the ones uh, that stick around for decades. And it's really, really hard to do. And and um, I don't remember kind of, I guess it was Joe as well, sort of in, the, in a different conversation, but you know, they think about an Airbnb around sort of building not the machine, but the machine that builds the machine. And so I think you've got to kind of get meta or fractally rent around these things oftentimes to sort of see uh, how to do that at, at kind of the process level. But that, that probably was one that, you know, I'd say sort of challenges uh, conventional wisdom around product design and what it means to sort of be successful or build a successful company. Totally. And I mean, it's so well said. And I think, you know, the, the funny thing is anytime you hear one of those, you know, hearing that, obviously, it's somewhat counter because clearly you've heard this conventional wisdom. You, you hear people talking about product market fit as if it is a checkbox on a list. And as soon as you've checked it, you're good to go and you move on to the next one. But anyone that's been in a company intuitively knows that it is this liquid, very mushy, very difficult thing. And it's much harder to sustain it than it is. You know, it's like, I don't know, it's like uh, winning a super Bowl once versus winning a Super Bowl seven times. It's like, do you want to just, you know, win the game once or do you want to build a dynasty? Um, Anyways, it's so interesting and so well said. The last question I want to ask is, you know, going back to your path to becoming an investor, you know, it's something that you never really set your sights on and decided this is what you wanted to do. You ended up kind of stumbling into it and yet you've had this fabulous, wonderfully successful career at Foundation, you know, doing that. What advice would you give to young and inspiring venture investors or people that maybe aren't sure whether they should be an investor or not that are trying to sort that out in their own minds? Well, we're all influenced by our own experiences, maybe over overfitting them. Um, but my advice to folks who are still early in their career, um, early enough to take risk, um, is to is to go build something, is to get a real job, to join uh, a rocket ship or to build something from scratch. I think there is sort of, I used to talk about this as the efficient frontier for your career and kind of anything in between is, is, a, is a hard spot to be in. But, but the return on experience of building your own company is invaluable and the return on experience and in, in many ways, the return on uh, kind of your, you know, kind of financial investment in your time in joining a rocket ship company is also quite good. So I, I think, you know, my advice oftentimes is get a real job, learn how to sell, learn how to scale yourself and your team, uh, learn how to lay off a fifth of your team when, you know, hard times hit, but but do it with respect and then figure out how to build back up from there. And I think in so many ways, this is informed by my experience of, of you know, building products and teams, which is like, until you've built something and broken it 
or helped manage it through some really scary times, which even the best companies go through, you know, at least a handful of those really scary white knuckle moments. Until you've done those things, you don't understand it. And so I think the way we help our founders more than anything is we have uh, we have a, a, a deep sense of uh, of empathy for what they are going through, and we can help them uh, through their their hardest challenges. And I think that they trust us because we have done that ourselves on the other side of the table in most cases. And so I think that um, that's probably my advice to folks um, who are thinking about a job and venture is, uh, is, you know, maybe let it, let it happen to you instead of seek it out, um, uh, explicitly. Yeah. And develop that scar tissue first, (laughs) because you're going to need to lean on it and point to it and, you know, be able to empathize with it, uh, in the role. Yeah, it's very difficult. Well, thank you so much, Steve. This has been an incredible interview. You know, I could talk with you for three more hours, uh, but unfortunately, it's our, our time has come to a close. So I just want to say thank you so much for coming on and you know sharing a little bit about your story and the journey to build the foundation. The Great foundation fun today. <laughs> Thanks so much, Daniel. Great to chat with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. You can find the show notes and text transcript of this episode at outlieracademy.com slash 120. That's 120. And you can learn more about Foundation Capital at foundationcapital.com or by following Foundation Cap on Twitter. At outlieracademy.com, you can find all of our other investor interviews, profiling investment firms, including Driehaus Capital, NFX, Graycroft, Pantera Capital, Compound Kings, and more. In every interview, we deconstruct the ideas, frameworks, and strategies they use to generate incredible returns and incredible track records. You can find videos of all of our interviews on YouTube at youtube.com slash outlier academy. On our channel, you'll find all of our full length interviews as well as many, many of our favorite short clips from every episode, including this one. So make sure to subscribe. We post new videos and clips every single week. And if you haven't already, make sure to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn at outlier academy. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you right here with a brand new episode next Wednesday.